Good morning, and welcome to the start of a very exciting day at Buena Vista University. My name is Dr. Brian Lensmeyer. I'm an assistant professor of biology. I would like to thank the BVU students, faculty, and staff, high school students and teachers, members of the Storm Lake community, campus visitors, members of the Siebens family, President Moore, and Dr. Stephen Russell for joining us here today. In a few moments, Dr. Russell will deliver his lecture, Engineering Viruses to Fight Disease. This is the first lecture in our new Speaking of Science series. This is also an historic day at Buena Vista University. At three o'clock this afternoon, we will celebrate the opening of the new Estelle Sieben Science Center. I invite you to join us as we dedicate this amazing facility, a facility that has already begun to transform our campus. At this time, I will turn things over to Ms. Kate Ross. Kate is a senior biology major from Anamosa, Iowa, and will introduce Dr. Russell. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Stephen Russell, Director of the Molecular Medicine Program at Mayo Clinic College of Medicine in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Russell is a board certified hematologist and world leader in the field of gene therapy. Dr. Russell graduated from Edinburgh University Medical School in 1982, having decided as a medical undergraduate that he would spend his life attempting to convert viruses into powerful anti-cancer drugs. He received his early hematology training at the University College Hospital London and his early laboratory research training at the Royal Marsden Hospital London. He obtained his PhD degree from the University of London in 1990 for a thesis entitled Recombinant Viruses Exp Expressing Lymphokine Genes, Their Construction and Use to Modulate Growth of Transplantable Rodent Tumors. In 1990, he moved to Cambridge, England, where he completed his clinical training and became, became a consultant hematologist in Adam Brooks Hospital, at the same time establishing his own gene therapy research laboratory in the prestigious Cambridge, Cambridge Center for Protein Engineering. During this time, he was the principal investigator for one of the earliest European gene therapy clinical protocols and was the scientific founder of Cambridge Genetics, a biotechnology startup company. Dr. Russell moved from Cambridge to Mayo Clinic Rochester in 1998 to build and direct a new molecular medicine program focused on the development and clinical testing of novel genetically based therapeutics. Dr. Russell was one of the founding board members of the European Society of Gene Therapy and is now a member of the organizing committee of the American Society of Gene Therapy. He serves on the editorial boards of several scientific journals including Human Gene Therapy, Gene Therapy, the Journal of Gene Medicine, the Journal of Molecular Medicine and Blood. He is also the author or co-author of more than 100 peer-reviewed scientific publications. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Stephen Russell. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. and. Uh, I should stay at the start. It's an enormous honor for me to be uh, invited to this occasion um, to talk about my passion for viruses. And uh, really what I'm going to try and do today is just um, speak mainly to the students in the room who are um, looking at a career in science and just um, talk about what my experience has been with getting interested and involved in the area of science that I've wanted to do. And, uh, and really make the point that, you know, dreams really can come true in this, uh, in, in this area. So my topic is engineering viruses to fight disease. And it really started for me at medical school um, with a family tragedy. I was, as you've already heard, I was at medical school in Edinburgh. And in my third year at medical school, I was studying for my microbiology finals. I was very interested in microbiology. I was pretty much interested in anything I studied at medical school. But just after I'd finished my microbiology final exam, uh, and I'd done well, and I was invited back for a distinction oral, there was a death in the family. I had a phone call one morning to say that my 27-year-old sister had died in a house fire. 
And so at that time, I, I traveled home for the funeral. And in order to take my mind off this ghastly um, event, I, uh, I saturated myself in virology in preparation for this distinction oral. And it was during that time that I really got completely hooked on the idea of using viruses as a, a, a way to treat human disease. And here is, is just one s sort of subsection of the whole world of viruses. You know, viruses, are, uh, they're, they're incredible organisms. They're, they're very, very small. They're from 20 to 300 nanometers in diameter. They're all different shapes and sizes. They have all different types of, of genome. You know, they're nature's nanoparticles. These are about the same size as the nanoparticles that people are, uh, are building now from entirely synthetic materials. And what they do is they get inside cells and they wreak havoc. Um, and then they're eventually defeated, in most cases, by the immune system. But I got very, very um, interested in these viruses at that time. And this is really the dream that um, I decided I was going to spend my life pursuing. And I had no doubts whatsoever about this. This is what I wanted to do, having gone through that period of my life. Viruses destroy tissue, and we all know that uh, a hepatitis virus will destroy liver tissue. The HIV virus will destroy cells in the immune system. So, you know, clearly there's a possibility that one could build viruses that would specifically destroy cancer. So maybe you could harness this destructive ability of viruses for good. Now, of course, when I started talking to people about this, there were issues. The first reaction most people have is, oh, it's way too dangerous. You can't possibly think in terms of using viruses for the treatment of disease. But once you get into the detail of it, there are really very safe ways in which you can do that, in which the worst case scenario is something um, very, very acceptable. So as soon as people accept that, yeah, OK, maybe there are viruses that you could use for this purpose, they then immediately switch to the next argument, which is, well, of course, it won't work. I mean, you know, they'll, they'll, these viruses that you make that aren't dangerous will just be completely destroyed by the immune system. So then you have to talk about strategies to control the immune response to the virus in order that it can do its job. And then the final criticism is, well, you know, you're between the devil and the deep blue sea here. You've got something dangerous, you're trying to make it less dangerous, and you're going to give it to people and you won't know what's going on. You, know, you won't know whether it's spreading and doing damage here or there or whatever, and it's a moving target the whole time. So how are you going to be able to monitor what's going on with this virus? So those were the sort of big issues that would come up. And actually, if I just run through my early career after medical school, it's, it's quite an unusual collection of jobs, this. Typically, after medical school in the UK, you go through a number of short-term positions in order to acquire some general medical training. And this is an unusual mix. And part of the reason it's an unusual mix is that I would turn up for job interviews, and they would say to me, so what do you want to do uh, as a career, Dr. Russell? And I would say, I want to treat cancer with viruses. And they would say, thank you. Um, next, please. <laughs> and so you know, I learned very quickly that it's best at interview not to say exactly what you're thinking all the time. And things picked up. And then eventually, I found myself um, attracted to a career in hematology. And I moved from Scotland down to London to University College Hospital and spent a couple of years um, beginning my hematology training there. But all the while, I was desperate to get into the lab and start working on viruses. I had no practical experience, no hands-on experience of what you could do with viruses. And so my big break came in 1987 when I was accepted into a research lab at the Marsden Hospital, the big cancer hospital in London. And there, I could start working on engineering viruses. And the reason this opportunity arose was because of gene therapy. Because at that time, people were looking at how could they use genes as therapeutic agents to treat disease. And viruses were a very important part of that, um, of, of that area of science, because viruses deliver genes into cells. And so they were the ideal gene delivery vehicles. So I got to start working on gene therapy. And just for those of you who, um, who, who haven't 
uh, looked into this much, gene therapy can be defined as the intentional introduction of genes into human somatic cells for the treatment of disease. And this somatic word is very important. It is not, as many people assume, an attempt to change the germline, to change future generations. It's simply an attempt to introduce genes into damaged tissues in order to change the function, repair the function, and, um, uh, and uh, benefit people who have pre-existing problems. And there are two ways in which gene therapy is done. Either cells are removed from the patient, genetically modified and put back in, and this is obviously much easier than the other approach, which is to put genes directly into the patient such that they find their way to the target tissue and mediate a therapeutic effect. This is easier because you have the cell's captive audience. You can genetically modify them. You don't have to worry about targeting the delivery of your genes into the target. Here you have to have a, a, a much more sophisticated type of gene therapy that knows exactly where it's going and what it's going to do in the body. And the, the key to gene therapy is the vectors, the gene delivery vehicles. And they're fairly complex in relation to conventional therapeutics, small molecule therapeutics, because they have at the, at the heart is the drug here, which is the nucleic acid. So this is the therapeutic gene, which is completely inert, but once it's inside the nucleus of the cell, will encode a therapeutic protein, which will uh, do some good, hopefully. The control element here, the regulatory element, determines when, where, and at what level that gene is going to be expressed. It's like a rheostat that's turning this light bulb on and off at, um, at different levels in different situations. Now, this nucleic acid is very, very vulnerable to attack in the environment by nucleases that exist everywhere, and so it has to be protected during its transportation to its destination by some kind of vehicle and in the surface of that vehicle, there have to be some elements that can recognize the target and direct the vehicle to its appropriate destination. And this is a simplified view of a vector, but clearly it has multiple components and therefore differs very much from a conventional small molecule. And in fact, I like to think of this a bit like the motor car industry, you know, that we have all these different moving parts that we're putting together to make sophisticated machines that will deliver um, genes exactly where we want them. And in terms of where we're at in relation to the motor car industry, we're, we're pretty early on, and we're looking at fairly rudimentary vectors at the moment, but people are continually working on every aspect of vector development to improve them. And broadly, there are two classes of vector. On the one hand, there are entirely synthetic vectors in which we make plasmid DNA in bacteria, uh, we wrap it up in lipid uh, shells, and then we put proteins into the surface. And that seems a nice, safe way of making gene therapy vectors, but the problem with those synthetic vectors is they are incredibly inefficient at delivering their genes into cells. So the other class of vectors is far, far preferable, at least at this point in time, and that's to use viruses to deliver genes. Viruses have evolved over millions and millions of years to do precisely that. They deliver their bad genes into living cells in animals or humans, and then they cause those cells to produce many viral proteins and, and produce more copies of the virus, which then spread to other cells. So the trick of using virus is to remove the viral genes from the virus and replace them with useful therapeutic genes. And so this was the, uh, this was the area that I got into um, during my PhD. Then having finished my PhD, I moved to Cambridge and there continued with my training as a hematologist and completed that, became a consultant in hematology. But at the same time, I worked in one of the world's leading molecular biology laboratories there and continued to develop my interest in gene therapy and engineering viruses and, um, and tried to translate some of the work that we were doing into the clinic. And actually, it came quite frustrating that Although Cambridge is one of the most wonderful centers in the world for basic science, it is not a good place to do translation from lab to clinic. It's very, very difficult to, um, uh, to, to get access to the type of infrastructure that would be required to take um, an idea all the way through from the lab to the clinic, and I'll talk more about that. So after I'd been in Cambridge for seven years, I had a 
a phone call from the chair of the search committee at Mayo Clinic who was looking for a new director for this molecular medicine program. And he said, you know, we, we're interested in gene therapy at Mayo Clinic. Uh, we really want to build a program here. Um, we have 10,000 square feet of lab space. We have seven faculty positions to fill. Uh, we have a lot of um, funding for this initiative, uh, much of it from the Siebens Foundation. And, uh, and I thought he was going to offer me one of the faculty positions. But he said, and we'd like you to direct it. And I, I, I just about fell off my seat. I, I didn't know what to say. I, what I did say was, well, thank you very much. I'll call you back tomorrow. <laughs> and uh, I took, took a, a bit of time to recover. But that was a, a, just an enormous opportunity for me. And he handed me this mission statement, which had been developed ahead of me coming to Mayo, which was to build the premier translational gene therapy in the country effectively integrating relevant basic science and clinical investigation, applying this to patient care in a timely and responsible manner. And that was just, for me, an irresistible challenge, particularly in the context of this, um, uh, the, this very, very famous um, organization. So I agreed to come and, um, and accept this challenge. And in order to decide how to use the opportunity, I had to think about the whole process of gene therapy um, in a more strategic way than I had done before. But basically, it boiled down to this. You know, what we needed to build was a big preclinical research effort in which people would design and construct gene transfer vectors, they would test them in model systems, and they would iteratively go around this process, improving them until such time as they were ready to be tested in the clinic. And then they would need to uh, get through this translational process, test the vectors in the clinic, and maybe come back again into the preclinical cycle to improve and do it again. And what we had available was a lot of space, a lot of faculty positions, and a lot of funding to support this enterprise. And it's gone extremely well. And I. I simply cannot cover all of the different things that are going on within this program, but we're developing gene therapy for cardiovascular disease, for cancer, for eye disease, for HIV disease, you name it. There are many, many different projects going on. But I'm going to stick with this pathway of my passion for using replicating viruses for therapy, and I'm going to tell you about what we've been doing with measles virus in my laboratory within this program. So this is measles virus. And you all know what measles is. It's, it's one of the um, childhood um, fevers, which used to be very common, but which is less common now. Uh, measles virus is a negative strand RNA virus. It has a genome with 16,000 um, base pairs of sequence coding for six proteins. And these proteins uh, wrap the genome up in, uh, in a nucleoprotein core and then the, uh, the virus buds from the cell and has an envelope uh, which contains the proteins, the matrix protein, the hemagglutinin, and the fusion protein. And these surface proteins are very important because they mediate virus attachment and entry into target cells. So that's the virus. And the reason I was so attracted to measles virus is because this is what it does to cells. If you, if you take a monolayer of cells like this and you infect them with virus, then a single cell will fuse with all its neighboring cells to form a large multinucleated syncytium. This is the same cell monolayer at the same magnification. And this is, is 24 hours after it's been infected with measles virus. And each of these is just a single cell got infected and fused with a large number of neighbors. <laughs> and in addition to that, there was this story in The Lancet of a boy who in 1971 presented to a clinic in Africa with a very nasty Burkitt lymphoma. This is a retroorbital tumor, um, which is very, very difficult to treat. And this tumor was biopsied. And when this boy came back to the clinic a couple of weeks later, and they had the answer that it was Burkitt's lymphoma, they were unable to treat him because he had measles. And they had to wait for the measles to go away. What then happened was that his tumor spontaneously disappeared without any therapy, just in the course of a natural measles virus infection. And what I think happened is that the measles virus destroyed the tumor. And 
So therefore, well, you know, we couldn't really think about using wild-type measles virus as a treatment for cancer. Wild-type measles is a dangerous pathogen. It's still responsible for the deaths of about a, mil a million children globally every year. But we do have access to this um, form of measles virus, which is rather similar to the wild type, uh, which has been attenuated by growing it in tissue culture. We've all had it. We give it to all of our children. And um, so we thought maybe we could do something with this virus. And to our great delight, we discovered that when we started working with the attenuated me measles virus, it does efficiently infect and kill all the human tumor cells that we've looked at. It's very selective in killing tumor cells and sparing normal cells. We can engineer the virus to express additional genes, and we can uh, make very stable recombinant viruses. And in the animal models that we looked at, this virus was potent in the treatment of lymphoma, multiple myeloma, ovarian cancer, brain tumors, and pancreatic cancer. And we haven't tested it in other tumors, so it may have broader activity than that. So where did it come from, this vaccine strain of measles virus? Well, this is David Edmonston. And in 1954, David Edmonston had the measles when he was 10 years old. And the virus was isolated from his throat and then grown on various different cellular substrates over the years. And every single vaccine strain of measles virus in current use came from this man's throat. And so he's responsible for the control of measles virus infection, at least to the extent it's been controlled globally. Now, what happened then back in the um, late 1980s was that um, the genome of this virus was completely cloned, and an infectious clone of the virus was made. And by mid-1990s, it was possible to use this infectious clone to engineer the virus and generate recombinant versions of the virus. And that's really what opened up the possibility of using this virus for cancer therapy. So, you know, not only has he been responsible for controlling measles virus infection, he's now uh, potentially going to be responsible for controlling cancer. Okay, so we, I'm not going to show you um, all the experiments that we did to show that this measles virus was effective against tumors, but we started to think about how could we improve it by engineering it. And obviously, the key issues for us, if we want to give a virus uh, systemically in order to uh, infect and destroy tumors, is that we'd like it to be targeted specifically to the tumor. We'd like it to spread within the tumor, and we'd like to be able to monitor that spread. And then we'd like to have it um, extremely potent in destroying the tumor. So. These are the three strategies that I'm going to briefly touch on that we have used to enhance the performance of the uh, original measles virus that we started with. We've introduced genes into the viral genome that allow us to monitor the virus, that allow us to arm the virus and make it more potent, or that allow us to target the virus to specific destinations. And so first of all, on the targeting front, the, um, the targeting strategy is to take these surface proteins on the virus and to modify them in such a way that they now have a different recognition capability and can get into a cell through a receptor specifically expressed, for example, on a cancer cell. And the detail of how we did that was, of course, we had to focus on these proteins on the surface of the virus, and it's the H protein that mediates virus attachment to its receptor before it then triggers fusion and allows the virus to enter the target cell. So we, we worked out how to knock out the normal binding of this H protein and introduce targeting ligands such as monoclonal antibodies onto the protein in order to retarget the virus. And this took many, many years. We had worked in Cambridge on many other viruses to, to try and achieve the same goal and had been unsuccessful. But for some reason, measles seemed to be a very tractable system for this. And here's an example of some fully retargeted measles viruses. So what you have here is you have a panel of six different cell lines, each one expressing a different receptor. And here you have a panel of five viruses. The untargeted virus is able to infect cells that express the natural measles receptors. 
And what you're looking at here is a virus that is not only targeted, but also contains the gene for a jellyfish protein, green fluorescent protein. And so when this virus infects a cell, the cell fluoresces bright green. And so you can see individual infected cells here, but when they fuse together to form syncytia, you see big green syncytia. So the untargeted virus infects through its natural receptors. The ablated virus is almost fully ablated. It certainly can't fuse anymore through these um, receptors. But then the fully retargeted viruses are very well behaved. They do not infect via the natural measles receptors, and they infect very specifically through the receptors against which they've been targeted. So this retargeting work is, is, uh, is really, it was um, extraordinary to me that we were, uh, it could so easily achieve full retargeting of measles virus. And just for those of you who think this is all very complex, high-tech, out-of-reach stuff, this is Brandon Parman, who came to me as a junior at high school in 2000 and said, I want to come and work in your lab, and I want to do measles virus engineering. And I said to him, don't be ridiculous. I mean, you're, you're, you're still at school, you, and you, you can't possibly have the time and, and um, uh, an application that it would take to do this. And he, um, he was quite dismissive of what I said and said, look, I, I do want to come and work in your lab. So, and he, was, he, had, he brought his father along, and eventually I agreed, OK, he can come into the lab. And so what he did then was he made a virus that was specifically targeted to melanoma cells. And he, he did absolutely wonderful work on this virus. He went to the regional science fair. He went to the state fair. He won both. He then went to the international science fair in 2002. And he came out with first prize for top biology project. Uh, he won $20,000. He got to have breakfast with the president. And you know, I just show this to make the point that really, you know, you don't have to, you don't have to have had all the training yet in order to get going and start doing spectacular things in science. You really, this stuff is within reach. Okay, so for the monitoring, we introduced into the virus a gene that codes for a soluble marker. So now if, if cells are infected with this virus, they release into the medium or into the serum, if it's in vivo, a marker that we can just measure by a simple blood test. So we can just take serial blood tests and we can follow what's going on with this virus. You know, is it spreading? Is it stopped spreading? Has it been eliminated? And this is the idea. Give the, give the virus to the patient and then do serial blood testing to see whether it's, it's growing excessively, whether it's growing and then disappearing, or whether it's just failing altogether. This sort of, um, of capability is very important if you're doing a an early phase clinical study and you want to know whether it's safe to move up to the next dose level, up to the next dose level. If this is what you see, then it's time to move on to the next dose. And when you reach this point, that's about the right dose. If you go here, you've gone too far. So we, we made such a virus. We tested it in a model of ovarian cancer. The virus was very effective against a mouse model of ovarian cancer when we gave it into the peritoneal cavity. And ovarian cancer is a very, very important malignancy. It's still the major gynecological malignancy that causes mortality in women in this country. And the treatment is not satisfactory for ovarian cancer. And very often, uh, it becomes refractory to, to, to treatment while it is still confined completely to the peritoneal cavity. So administering virus into the peritoneal cavity is a reasonable way to approach this disease. And on the basis of those successful mouse studies, we uh, developed a clinical protocol uh, in which patients with advanced ovarian cancer would receive this virus into the peritoneal cavity uh, repeatedly. And we'd start from a very low safe dose and then move gradually up to um, uh, a higher, more effective dose. Now, for translation, you know, previously I just showed you these two circles. So now we were into this translation process. And people are often um, a bit naive about the process of translation. They think, OK, so you've done your preclinical thing. It works. Now give it to patients. Well, it's not as simple as that. You cannot just take what you made in the lab and give it to patients. You have to go through a, a, a huge process. 
you have to manufacture the vector in a dedicated manufacturing facility according to FDA regulations of good manufacturing practice um, that govern the manufacture of anything that's to be used for human. You have to do uh, a whole bunch of toxicology and pharmacology studies in appropriate animal species in order to get the required re regulatory approvals. You have to develop your clinical protocol, so you have to be working very closely with clinicians who actually look after this group of patients. And so all of this is, is a lot of work. And it's, in fact, a lot more work than the stage of just developing the, um, the proof of principle that something can be therapeutically useful. And so uh, we were fortunate. We had a, a vector manufacturing facility uh, built into the whole schema at Mayo. We had a toxicology core and a pharmacology core. Uh, we have many, many clinicians interested in working with us to develop clinical protocols. And we managed um, to get through all these regulatory processes. The RAC is the Recombinant DNA Advisory Committee, which reviews all gene therapy protocols publicly. The, the meetings are open to the public. And uh, this is a very interesting venue. You have to send in all the details of what you're proposing to do. It's reviewed by experts. You have to go to Washington, D.C. and defend what it is you're proposing to do. Suggestions are made. You have to re respond to the suggestions. And then the, the FDA obviously has very rigorous requirements about what is uh, produced in terms of paperwork. This is what we sent to the FDA for a pre-IND meeting. So this was the meeting before, this was the application before the application that would finally be approved for the protocol. And it's just huge, the amount of paperwork involved in this. And obviously the local committees, the IRB and the, uh, the Biosafety Committee have to uh, give you the green light as well to go ahead. So it took us about three years to get through this whole process. And that was with the foot you know, really hard on the accelerator and with a lot, of, um, a, a lot of facilities at our disposal. But finally, we treated our first patient on July 12th this year. And you know, we were obviously hoping that the world would change on that day. But the nature of a phase one clinical study is such that you have to start with an almost homeopathic dose of the agent. You have to build gradually up between cohorts of three patients. So although uh, we've treated two patients now, and there's been no toxicity, but you know, neither have these patients had major responses to the treatment. OK, so the, 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 the third approach that I'll briefly touch on is a way to increase the potency of this virus um, to kill tumors. And, and why would we want to increase its potency? Well, this actually is the disease that I'm most interested in from a, a clinical practice perspective because I'm a hematologist and I do look after patients with multiple myeloma at Mayo Clinic. And this is a very difficult disease. It's, um, it's a disease of cells of the immune system which causes bone destruction. You can see these um, little dark areas where the disease is eroding the bone. And it causes immune deficiency. And with current treatment, it is not curable. And so we desperately need new treatments for this disease. There are about 16,000 cases every year in the USA alone. So we showed that our green measles virus could very efficiently destroy myeloma cell lines. Um, the tiny little green spots here are individual cells. The big balloons are syncytia containing 100 to 1,000 cells which are going to die. And it worked on myeloma cells derived directly from patients. But when we infected normal blood cells, peripheral blood lymphocytes, um, a few of them got infected, but they certainly didn't fuse and they certainly didn't die. They were all fine. But then when we tested the virus in animal models, we found that it was in some cases very effective, but in other cases the tumors were quite resistant to the virus. And so that was why we wanted to somehow enhance the efficiency with which the virus could destroy these tumors. And the inspiration for what to do next came from my dear wife, Janie. So about a year or so after we arrived in, in, uh, in the US, Janie uh, noticed that she had a, a lump in her neck. And she went to the um, endocrinology clinic. The lump was biopsied. It was found to be a thyroid um, malignancy. 
which was very quickly removed. And you know, I'm pleased to say that, as far as we can tell, the entire tumor was removed. There was nothing else left in the body. It was all very efficiently handled. But I was speaking then to her consultant endocrinologist, saying, so, well, what if? You know, what if there's a, a problem later and the tumor comes back? And he said, well, actually, you can treat this malignancy with radioactive iodine if it spreads elsewhere. Because the thyroid is very efficient at picking up radioactive iodine from the blood. Iodine's needed in order to make thyroxine. And so, and it's because of this protein, NIS, which is expressed in the thyroid, and it's a pump that pumps iodine into thyroid cells. And you can use radioactive iodine to destroy an overactive thyroid gland. You can use it, as I said, for effective therapy for thyroid cancer, and that's all due to this NIS protein. So, of course, then we made the measles virus with the NIS gene in it. And we found that if we infected cells with that um, NIS expressing measles virus, and then we looked at their ability to concentrate radioiodine from the tissue culture medium, they could really pick up a lot of radioactive iodine, whereas cells infected with the unmodified measles virus did not. And when we looked in vivo at what would happen if we grew one of these resistant tumors in a mouse and then gave the virus intravenously, wait seven days to allow the virus to spread in the tumor, and then give radioactive iodine, this is the sort of image we could obtain. So this is the CT scan of the mouse. This is its thyroid gland. So this is looking at the radioactive iodine here on a gamma camera, and oh, actually on a, a, a positron emission a tomography machine. So we can see the thyroid, so the thyroid's taking out the iodine. We can see a little bit of stomach, because the stomach does express some of this protein, and then we see the tumor very efficiently concentrating this um, radioactive iodine. One thing I've learned, actually, since I got into imaging is that no matter how good your imaging equipment is, the resolution's never high enough. And actually, these images were done on a human scanner in the middle of the night, and we, we are just about to get a brand new scanner that will allow us to do PET CT imaging in mice, and it'll give us much, much better resolution than this, which should be good. Um, okay, so if we, if we took those mice and we gave the virus into the tail vein and then asked what happens to the tumors, virus alone, they kept on growing. Wild-type virus with radioactive iodine, they kept on growing. MVNIS alone, virus alone, they kept on growing. But if we gave MVNIS and then we gave radioactive iodine, they regressed completely and they didn't come back and they regressed very fast. So clearly that is a nice way of enhancing the potency of the virus and that led us to propose a second clinical trial for patients with multiple myeloma in which we will give that virus by intravenous administration. So we're now working very hard to um, move that one forward into the clinical practice. So that's all I'm going to tell you about the, uh, the science that's uh, been going on in my lab since I moved to Mayo. We've, um, we've obviously done a lot of engineering of this virus to improve its performance in respect of the treatment of cancer. Um, we, in parallel with this, have done an awful lot of studies on the mechanism by which the virus is causing damage uh, in a specific way to tumors. Um, we've pushed this whole translational process, and you know, we've now arrived at the point where we can begin to do clinical testing. And I think you know, what's down the road, if everything goes well, and if this treatment is um, proving to be successful, is that Mayo Clinic is not going to turn into a drug company that manufactures and sells and distributes drugs. And, you know, if you do develop any kind of effective therapy for cancer, at some point it needs to be transferred to industry because, you know, industry really knows how to do all that stuff. And uh, the question is just when is the appropriate time to do that? And I think, you know, probably it's at the point at which uh, proof of principle has been obtained in the clinic that this can be an effective therapy. Uh, so that's what we're, we're looking forward into the, to, to in the future. But, you know, from the point of view of a science wanting to get involved in this, there are so many different points at which involvement can happen. There are so many different careers that are um, of interest and importance in relation to such a process. And overall, my, my message to you from this talk is first that modern-day scientific research is fun. It's really good fun. It's exciting. 
It's fast moving and it's full of opportunities to improve our lives. You know, there are so many things you can pick on and you can chase and you can make a difference. And with good training, with innovative thinking and with access to good facilities, almost anything is possible. And the sooner you start, the more fun you're going to have and the more you're going to achieve. And I, looking around the campus here, I am just completely blown away by this new science center. I mean, it is the most wonderful facility to have available at this stage in your careers. You know, I would, I would just have, have given anything to have access to such facilities when I was at that stage in my own career. I certainly want to uh, encourage my kids to come here to do their, uh, um, to do their time here. And, I just think you're very, very lucky, but you, you should bear this in mind. You know, you really can, people are so easily put off because they think everything's so big and so daunting and so far out of reach, and it's not. You can do whatever you want to do. And finally, I should just say, you won't know who these people are, but you know, I'm standing here telling a story, and I don't want you to assume that I should take credit for the whole story. There are a vast number of people involved in the work that I've talked about, doing all kinds of small component parts of it. There are many different labs at Mayo Clinic involved in studying the biology of measles virus, um, studying the immunology of measles virus, uh, working on different ways to improve it from an engineering technology perspective. There's all the different clinical groups who are very interested and supportive of developing uh, measles virus for therapy of these different diseases. And then there's the translational activities of toxicology and manufacture. And these are just the names of the, of the group leaders for each of those groups. You know, each of these groups has you know, nine or ten people, and I just don't want to saturate you with a whole bunch of names, but they're you know, everybody is, is very important in contributing to this whole process. And I'll stop there, and uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Yeah, that we, we've thought about that, but um, I think there are other, other ways to approach that problem. And, you know, what, the, the, there's the, the omics revolution going on at the moment of um, studying the genome and the proteome. And one of the aspects of that, that that really I think is quite appealing is that people are taking blood or other body fluids from patients with very early stage cancer. And they're, they're running it through a complete analysis of every protein that's there. Instead of just looking at individual proteins, it's this kind of mass approach to studying, instead of individual proteins, the whole proteome. And what they're looking for is differences between the, um, the proteins present in the blood of patients with early stage cancer versus those who have late stage. And I think that type of technology is probably going to have a much higher sensitivity of detecting a really, really small number of tumor cells that's putting out a small amount of a protein into the blood than we would have with using the virus as a way to, um, to detect the tumor. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. So, um, so within the program, we have retrovirus, lentivirus, HIV we work with quite a lot as a vehicle, but we wouldn't use it as a replicating agent. Um, we have herpes virus work, um, syndibus virus is an alpha virus, SV40, um, we, we, you know, any virus that looks as if it might be promising We'll, we'll import it, take a look at it, see whether we think it offers advantages compared to the viruses we, we already have. <clears throat> so this, you know, arriving at measles wasn't just to clutch it out of thin air. It was based on comparison of many different viruses. And we use the other viruses for other applications. 
you know, if you want to stably modify the genome of a cell and have the viral genes insert into the, into the chromosome of the cell such that when it divides, both the daughter cells will have that inserted gene, then you need to use retrovirus or lentivirus. And um, so it really depends on the goals of the treatment, what virus you would use. As far as viruses for therapy of cancer that replicate is concerned, adenovirus, herpes virus, vesicular stomatitis virus, and, a, and an avian virus, Newcastle disease virus, are all being used in the clinic now by different groups, different places, as a, um, a, a therapeutic approach for the treatment of cancer. No. Yeah, the question was, are we overwhelming the FDA? Because there's such an acceleration and, you know, new, um, new applications coming all the time to FDA. But we, um, we have found that FDA are extremely knowledgeable. And that, I think, is one of the huge differences between here and the UK. You know, I, I did go through the regulatory process in the UK with a clinical protocol that I was, um, I was doing in Cambridge. And they were completely at sea. The reviewers didn't really understand this new technology area. But I think here, the, the FDA, you know, they're made up of people drawn from the scientific community who decided to go in that direction. They're well staffed in these different areas. And, um, and it's very, very kind of intelligent interaction that one has with the FDA. They impose a lot of, you know, you must do this, that, and the other. So there are a lot of hurdles that are put in, in the way by FDA, but I think they're all reasonable. I mean, they, they really are focused primarily on safety, and they don't want anything getting into the clinic unless they're absolutely certain that everything has been done to, to ensure them that, that the safety is as it should be. But they respond quickly. You know, if I send a, a letter today to the FDA saying, I want a, an IND, I want a pre-IND meeting to discuss protocol X, they will give me that meeting within six weeks. And it'll be a phone conference and I'll have four or five FDA people there, one looking at the clinical protocol, one looking at the proposed toxicology, one looking at the proposed manufacturing, and a couple of others. And you know you have a good, solid interaction with them, and they advise you on what you should and shouldn't do. Um, so it's it's working well. Yeah, there's a lot of interest in in doing that because at the moment treatments for viral infections are rather limited, with the exception of HIV. You know, HIV therapy has really, really advanced very strongly over the past 10 years. And now, you know, if you can afford the drugs, there are some good drugs available, and, and it's a controllable viral infection. But for most viruses, it's just, well, too bad. You've got a virus, you know, and there isn't a drug that will control it. So we, we do need to consider the question of fail-safes. The NIST gene is a failsafe because when we give the radioactive iodine, that terminates the viral infection, as well as delivering this boost to the therapeutic efficacy of the virus. Um, the concern that, that people express then is, well, what if you have mutant viruses arising? Because you know, viruses mutate all the time. I mean, that's what they do. So what if you have mutant viruses that don't have the NIST gene, you know, that aren't going to be killed, that escape, and so on? And that is something that we don't know whether or not that's ever going to happen. Um, we do know that if it does happen, the danger level is not going to be very high with an Edmonston strain measles virus. I mean, remember, with Edmonston measles virus, there have been over a billion doses administered to people. And there have so far been five recorded deaths due to progressive spread of the virus in those people, uncontrolled spread of the virus. And when those five people were studied more closely to determine whether that was because of a virus mutation, it was not. It was because those people had no immune system whatsoever. 
So there was a patient with very advanced HIV disease and there were some kids with severe combined immune deficiency. And so the virus did not actually mutate back to a more dangerous form. So I think this measles that we're working with is so far gone away from, from being a, a pathogen that it's not going to get back there. Thank you very much, Dr. Russell. I would encourage anybody who wants to ask Dr. Russell some more questions to certainly feel free to come up here after uh, we're dismissed. I have a couple of announcements. Um, at this time, I'd like to invite our visiting high school students and teachers to remain here in Anderson Auditorium. Rochelle Brennan will come up here shortly to provide you with instructions for the rest of your visit. I also want to remind you that we will continue with our celebration this afternoon at three o'clock with the dedication of the new Estelle Sieben Science Center. This ceremony will take place directly south of the building and will be followed by guided tours of the new facility. I encourage all of you to attend this ceremony. Thank you for coming this morning. I look forward to seeing all of you, everyone, at three o'clock. And thank you again, Dr. Russell.